Welcome to the Pain Care Specialists of Oregon Facebook Live and YouTube Live presentation with today, Dr. Yaw Sarpong, neurosurgeon. Today, Dr. Yaw Sarpong plans to discuss surgical management of back pain. How are you, Dr. Sarpong? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for the invitation, Dr. Chan. Pleasure. Great to see you. Yeah. Well, um, hello. My name is Dr. Yaw Sarpong. I'm a neurosurgeon, as Dr. Chen said. Um, just a little bit about my background. Uh, I went to uh, undergrad at Emory in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, went to medical school at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. Did my residency in uh, uh, the University of Washington, Seattle, and then finished out in Missouri. Um, I've been in practice since 2017. Uh, my specialty includes brain and spine. I've done a lot of spine surgeries and have a, a lot, a lot of years doing spine uh, treatment of uh, uh, spine issues so using surgical management. But um, today, um, I wanted to kind of focus on surgical management of back pain. Now, I know some of my colleagues have talked to you about how to manage back pain using non-invasive ways, so exercises, medication, injections. But today, we want to talk about when it's okay to think about surgery for your back, so uh, when you have back pain. So uh, I'm going to start with the slides and kind of talk about um, the sort of how we proceed with this uh, presentation. So, so sort of an overview of the presentation. So we have it divided into two uh, uh, parts. When to do surgery and what, and what type of surgery can be done for one side back. So in this sense, we'll just discuss, you know, what to look for, what we're dealing with and why we do it. So when to do surgery. So there's three ways that we think about when it comes to um, uh, back sur surgery for, uh, for back pain. So. Uh, there's three phases. There's the neurological part, there's instability, and there's something called failed back syndrome. So for the neurological part, um, we think about something, uh, we think about things like weakness, uh, sensory changes, and bowel and bladder changes. So weakness is um, when you, let's say you come and see me in clinic and you say, you know, doc, my back started hurting and I have a hard time moving my hand, moving my feet. You know, I've, I'm kind of, I'm falling down when I walk. So that is, that's to me indicated something bad going on with, with, the, with the spine and we will get some images and look at it and see if we can treat it by surgery to relieve sort of the pressure on the nerves and prevent it from getting worse. And then sensor changes, which is numbness and tingling. So you can say, you know, doc, my neck or my back hurt. I'm sorry, having some numbness and tingling going into my feet, into my hands. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's, you know, hasn't gotten worse or it's staying the same. So if you're staying the same or it's improving, we can probably watch. We probably don't need surgery for that quite, quite a problem yet. But if you say, you know, it hasn't gotten better over two or three months or hasn't gotten better over like a last month, or if you say, you know, it's getting really bad and numbness is getting worse, and, you know, that's it's the sign that we may want to do surgery for this type of uh, back pain with, with this sort of numbness and tingling. One reader, one viewer is watching and wondering, is there one of these problems that they really need to be concerned about? either sure. themselves or their family members? I, like, is there a neurological problem that you really have to, hey, I got to see Dr. Sarpong at Pink Your Specialist of Oregon right now? I think um, for those, the motor weakness and the bowel and bladder changes. So the bowel and bladder changes, I think that is the worst. So if somebody has bowel and bladder changes, I would say I would encourage them to straight, go straight to the ER. Don't even come wait and come and see us. So bowel and bladder changes in the case that you have, you know, you have back pain and you started having problems controlling your bowel or controlling your bladder or having problems mm -hmm. retaining bowel, retaining, you know, your stool or retaining urine. That's a sign that you need uh, surgical intervention. So the motor weakness and the bowel and bladder change, those are the more serious problems because those are, tend to be irreversible. And if you delay on that too much, you could, you could be able, you'll be, you won't be able to get it back. Sensory changes, sensory changes, the sensory nerves are bigger and they are easy to, uh, Kind of heal themselves, so sensory change tend to be less of a concern as compared to the motor 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 weakness and bowel and bladder changes. So those are the things that I would say you you want to be happy vigilant about. And you want to come and see us as right away as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And then kind of going on to the next uh, phase of uh, when to do surgery, something called instability. So instability is when your spine moves or when your spine is not uh, stable. So oh, for example, let's say you were involved in a trauma and you um, started to have, you know, you have back pain and we get an X-ray or we get an image that shows that your spine mm -hmm. kind of moves back and forth like that or your spine is dislocated. <clears throat> that's very, that's a severe problem and that's something that needs intervention right uh, as soon as possible. And that needs surgery to help stabilize the spine. 
And sometimes, as we all get older, we have to have what we call degenerative changes. So we start having arthritis of the spine. The spine becomes incompetent. So what happens is like we start having slippage of the bone on top of bone. And that slippage can get worse when you walk, when you move. That can cause a lot of back pain. It also can compress the nerves. Mm -hmm. So those types of needs, um, surgery can eventually help treat it. Um, the other part that we think about is something called failed back syndrome. So this is a very sort of a generic term that we use to kind of combine a lot of problems that involves the back. So the main idea of failed back syndrome is that one, you've had some sort of treatment. So you've had surgery, which it can be any of the instrumentation, laminectomy, or anything that you've done to help treat your back pain, but it's not getting better and it's still getting worse. You're still having problems. So those are those categorize in, in, in a sense of failed back syndrome, and that is something that we can treat, but it's a different way of treating it. And it's something, and there's a one concept where, where you people just have a lot of back pain, nothing they've done is getting better. You get MRI, the spine looks fine. There's nothing that you can treat with surgery. Those mm -hmm. kind of falls in that concept of failed back pain because there's nothing you can do to fix the problem, but you can do this type of surgery to help deal with the problem. Mm. Are there too many surgeries to have? Uh, patients wondering, is there a limit? What what makes you, Dr. Sarpong, uh, choose to do another surgery or not to do so, another surgery? I think it comes down to what type of problem the patient have and what type of surgery they have. I would never say there's no there's not a concept of too many surgeries, but there's a time there's a point where you can say enough is enough. It's, what I, if I mm -hmm. do something, it's not going to help. Right. So it, it all depends on one, uh, what type of treatment they've had in the past. Two, um, how does the images look? And three, what kind of problems are they complaining of to me? Are they complaining of sort of a neurological problem? Are they compl complaining of this generalized pain? Or is there something that I know, you know the images tell me that we can do better to treat? So those mm -hmm. are the things that you worry about. So there's no such thing as you know, too many surgeries or too little surgeries, but there's also a point where you say surgery may not help. Okay. So what type of surgery can we do for the back? There's, um, we can they kind of categorize that into sort of a broad um, sort of categorization. So there's a concept called laminectomy, microdiscectomy, instrumentation, and spinal cord stimulator. So uh, we will take each one and talk about what that, what that means. So what is a laminectomy? So laminectomy is a way of what we call it freeing up, decompressing the spine. So when we say decompress, we're saying freeing, freeing up the nerves around the spine. So if you have, if you look at this MRI, um, there is uh, there's the nerves, which is this black thing coming down. There's what we call spinal fluid that's coming down. And as you can see, um, the spine is being squished at this level. And if you look at this cross section, you see the mm -hmm. spine is here, it's being completely squished right here. So when people have this type of problem, you know, if it's been going on for a long time, they will have something like, you know, numbness and tingling that's getting worse, back pain. They can also have weakness. They can have, and sometimes in the very bad case, they can have lose their bowel and bladder. And that's a very concern. So those are the types of times that's when you think about treating it. So we do something called laminectomy. So what is a laminectomy? So there are two uh, ways of doing a laminectomy. So if, I, if you're looking at the spine, um, if you uh, look at looking at the spine on um, uh, on this uh, on this uh, diagram right here, so this is the spinous process. We call this the lamina, and that's the facet joint. And mm -hmm. coming down is what we call the nerves. So that's what we have on this uh, diagram. So again, uh, spinous process, lamina, facet joints, you know, uh, transverse process, uh, spinal cord coming down with a bunch of nerves in it. The, uh, a nerve that's coming out, what we call the neuroforamen. So when we do a, a laminectomy, there's a, there's called a traditional laminectomy. There's so new ways of doing a modified laminectomy. So the traditional laminectomy is you come down, you take out this part and you remove the whole thing. That gives you room and frees up the nerve. So that's the standard laminectomy. However, sometimes you worry about if you take this out, you make the spine unstable. So that, that's, that, that led us to come up with a new way. So that's something called hemi -lamina hemi laminectomy, where you come in, you you open up this space and open up this space, right? This gives you room, allow you to free up the nerves and free up any sort of compression in the back and you're able to maintain this, uh, um, able to maintain sort of what we call the posterior element and help prevent the spine from being unstable. So 
those are the ways that we, we can do the laminectomy. And again, it varies for how you treat each person. Because I always say every person is unique in the way that they go about getting treated. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, you know, if I see a patient that I know will benefit from uh, from decompression, but if I know if I take this out, they may be doing stable and have to come back for screws or instrumentation. I would just do the the, lam- the small, we call the hemilaminectomy, so where we can free up the nerves, allow the spine to be able to be able to stable for the long term. So we don't worry about future problems. But if I see somebody that I think that will benefit from uh, decompression, I would just do the standing laminectomy so that the spine can be completely adequate, uh, completely and adequately um, uh, decompressed and allow the nerves to be free. So those that are, brings us to one of our viewers' questions, how you decide, Dr. Sarapong, on whether to put in hardware. People are wondering when do you uh, decide and how do you decide to put in the, the people talk about screws, rods, plates. I know you'll talk about other implants but how do you how do you make that determination so that will come in a little bit in the slide in the, in the presentation and um that's something that we will talk about um if you just give me two or three more slides we'll get to that question okay yep all right so now moving on to micro uh so another, another way of doing a new way of doing what we call um decompression not using um invasive ways uh it's called interspinous device so basically the idea of uh, decompression is that you have a spine that's collapsed and it's pushed on a nerve. Um, so instead of just going and drilling bone and causing more problems, you can put, put an interspinous device in, in people who don't have a lot of compression and can benefit from stabilization. So what you do, you put this device in between the spinous process here and kind of spread the device open. That opens up the foramen, opens up, a lot of the nerves to be free and not be compressed. So that's one way that that's one avenue that we can do, and it's less invasive compared to you know the laminectomy where we um, uh, do uh, take out the bone or do the uh, do the decompression. But again, that that can that only works in people that will not do well with a big surgery, and also work people who don't have a lot of compression, and it, and it's uh, it, it varies from, from patient to patient. Okay. Mhm. Okay. Now, moving on to microdiscectomy. So microdiscectomy is basically, you have a herniated disc, which is compressing the nerves, and you want to go in and try and take out the herniated disc. So as you see in this uh, MRI, uh, you have bone, bone, and in between bones, what we call the disc. And you see the disc coming out, and the nerves are coming down, but the disc, the disc is pushed on the nerve. So this patient, if, I were to, if you were to ask me, would probably have issues with numbness, tingling, weakness, and even because of how big the size of the disc is, if you look over here, how big and how compressed mm-hmm. you can have, people can have bowel bladder changes. And this type of disc needs to be, needs to uh, undergo surgery. And the surgery we do is what we call microdiscectomy. So looking at um, this sort of the diagram, which is, I know it's a little bit complicated, but if you just bear with me, I can just kind of walk you through it. So you come in, you identify the level. So this, this hernia disc was an L5S1. You make a small incision, and then you come down and you move the muscles off to the side, use the retractors to keep the muscles from the side. And you drill the bone, a little bit of the bone, and a little bit of the that kind of opens up a window so that you can get to the herniated disc. So that's the nerve being pushed away. That's another nerve being pushed down. And that's the spinal uh, fecal side coming down. And then you have the herniated disc right here. So you open up the, the caps around the disc and you kind of take it out and free up the space and you put something to cover it and you're done. Again, this is a very minimally invasive procedure and it's the same day procedure people go in from this it's the same day. They tend to have a good outcome because you have a disease that you were taking out and patients tend to do pretty well from that. Mm-hmm. And then we come down to the question of instrumentation and when point to do instrumentation. So instrumentation is a big surgery and before you get to that level, you want to make sure that, you know, patients really needs the surgery. So to get to instrumentation, there's, there's two things that you need to think about when the spine is unstable. So um, like I mentioned to you all during the early part, so when you have sometimes, this is a person who, uh, this MRI is somebody who's about 60, 60 years old. They have uh, collapsed this, and as you can see, the ligament is not able to hold the bone. So the bone has been pushed off. Then if you look at the x-ray, you see instead of lining up, there's a step off. This is unstable. So when somebody somebody with this type of background get up and move, they started having pain in their back. And also 
So because of how the slip of this happened, the nerve frame and where the nerves are coming out here and here is being compressed. So that is unstable. And if you were just to go decompress that, that will cause more slippage. So you want to be able to help support that. So the way we treat this is we want to go in and do something called inner body uh, fusion. So basically you come in, you do a decompression, and then you come in from the side and you put an artificial cage, you get rid of the, all the dead discs and put an artificial cage to help support the spine. And supporting the spine, that allows you to kind of provide support from the back and also open up the nerve framing. And then to prevent it from slipping, you put uh, screws and rods to hold it place and you put some bone graft along to allow it to fuse. And that's that's one of the reasons, that's one of the ways that you, you do fusion. Does that answer the question that? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then another way that you do fusion in the left side is when you have a trauma. So for example, uh, this patient was involved in a car accident and has something called a jump facet. Basically, the spine is being, the spine has been uh, warped so much that it's doing this right now. And that's not stable. And if he walks around like that, he will he will get paralyzed. So you want to go in and you want to fix that. And because the caps around the spine is, is broken and you want to put screws and rods to hold that place and prevent that from happening in the future. Again, the same with this neck fracture, which is very unstable. Um, you want to again go and provide support with screws and this game here with this uh, fracture that happened with the, what we call parse defect. And parse defect and it was really common in, in uh, young athletes um, who are playing a lot of sports. So they may go work out, come back, and they started mm -hmm. feeling numbness, tingling, started having problems moving their legs. And this is also an emergency that needs to come in so that we can uh, uh, treat it. And again, the same with this uh, spine structure. So what you do is, again, you can put screws in the bone to help hold, hold it, and you can put a plate in the neck to help hold it, and or you can put on this little small plate to help hold it, everything in place. So those are the ways when we, that's when we think about doing screws and um, rods and sort of cages to help support the spine because the spine is unstable, and if we don't support it, it will get worse. Any questions about that, Dr. Chen? Impressive. Very, very good. Very, very interesting. All right. Now, and then the last part is what we call uh, spinal cord stimulator. So spinal cord stimulator is uh, especially uh, targeted to doing, um, treating what we call fail back syndrome. So people with fail back syndrome have either undergone um, laminectomy or decompression of the spine. They've had some screws uh, placed. They've had a, a hernia disc that have undergone surgery. And after doing the surgery, you know, they still have the pain or still have the numbness and tingling. And you, we've tried, you've done all the images, everything looks fine, nothing is broken, no new disc herniation, no new stenosis. Those people will benefit from trying what we call the spinal cord stimulator. And sometimes you, uh, sometimes you people have uh, MRI of your back, that doesn't look any bad, anything, anything worse, but they have a lot of back pain. And this spine looks pristine, but people, some people have this and will have this, a lot of back pain, a lot of numbness and tingling. There's no surgery that we can do to help this, but you can try the spinal cord stimulator to help. So what is the spinal cord stimulator? So there's two phases of the spinal cord stimulator. The first phase is what we, what we do with needles and we use the needles uh, and why they place it at a level where we feel like it will help give some relief and then we'll attach the battery to your skin. This, uh, this uh, stimulation will, will stimulate the spine for a, a span of five days. And if you have a good, like a greater than 70% relief and you're doing well, when I see you, you're like, you know, doc, as soon as that was put in, I was, I was at least 70% better, I'm doing better. Then I'm confident that if we do a surgery and put this and make this permanent, you will have a good outcome. So, that is one way we do. So that's why I like this for some patients because one, you have a very minimally invasive procedure that will tell you if you have a good outcome, good outcome or not, or, and and that will give you a chance to say, you know what, this is for me, this is not for me. Mm -hmm. So with a with a spinal cord stimulator, the way we do is once you go through the first phase, and you have a good outcome. Uh, we'll see you. We'll make it. We'll make an arrangement to do surgery as an outpatient, where we go in um, in the in the sort of thoracic spine do a little opening and slide it, what we call paddle lead into the level where we felt like, well, where you had a good stimulation from. And then tunnel the wire that connects that beneath the skin into a battery that we put it in right, so your, your flank on the right or on the left, depending on how, how you want it. And then we will be able to kind of have, give you stimulation to the spine. 
an idea behind the stimulation is that you stimulate the spine so that the pain or the nerve sensation cannot go up into your brain. So that, that numbs the pain and you don't feel it. And that makes it helps a lot of people back pain, a lot of people with numbness and tingling. So one thing that we've been doing sometimes, you can use that to treat people with diabetic neuropathy with this sort of severe pain in their legs. Uh, spinal cord stimulant has been known to help those people as well. So those are the ways that we use to treat what we call fatal back syndrome. These people have had surgeries and without any relief, they've had normal looking spine, but they have some pain, they have some numbness and tingling. Or sometimes patients will, who have um, what we call diabetic neuropathy, where you know you have poor di you have bad diabetes and, and the nerves in your legs are being uh, are dying and it causing burning sensation in your legs. So those are the ways of doing uh, surgical management for, for back pain. Good. Um, so those were the question. So those were the presentation. And um, if anybody has questions, uh, we have a viewer asking um, specifically going back to that laminectomy and laminotomy. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we can talk about the differences again. Um, you had mentioned laminectomy and laminotomy, mm -hmm. um, and to a lot of people, I think it might might sound the same. How do you decide which to choose? Sure. So, you no. Know, in general, the, the traditional laminectomy, so for this patient, right, it's looking at how sort of compressed the spine is, this patient will benefit from a, a, a traditional laminectomy, so where you can very well decompress the spine, it would give you more room so that you can make sure that there's nothing compressing on it. But, you know, some patients, let's say this patient had, um, if I'm concerned this patient, you know, if we do a laminectomy, you take out sort of the posterior element, they will have, um, when I say posterior element, I mean, the ligaments and this and the bone that supports the back. If you were to take, if you were to take it out, and you're concerned that this may slip a little bit, you know, and it may lead to more people needing surgery. You you can come in and try to decompress by doing what we call laminotomy, which is basically small windows where you open up the lamina mm -hmm. here and open up the lamina here. That gives you room to free up the the, the, um, the sort of what we call the thicker sac in the nerves and gives you more room and allow the nerves to be free. Um, Sometimes it's difficult because, you know, you have this overhang that prevents you from seeing that underneath. So it makes it hard to really know that you've done a good decompression. But compared to the traditional laminectomy where you just come in and you take everything out. So if it's a preference, if you have somebody saying, you know, if somebody comes to me with this type of spine and don't have any sort of concern about what we call um, instability in the future where the spine will slip and needs need further surgery, I would just do a standing laminectomy because I, I know if I do a standing laminectomy, I know that they will have they will have a completely decompressed uh, spinal cord. And there's no chance that they, we may have missed something. Mm -hmm. Another viewer asking, Dr. Sarpan, what should I do before my surgery to make things go better or I guess make their surgery more effective? Sure. So, you know, uh, I always think of surgery as going to play a high level contact sport. So, you know, if you ever play any sports, you know, to be optimized, to be really, to be a good athlete and do well on the, on the day, on the, on the day of the game, you want to be in optimal shape. So you want to make sure, let's say if you have diabetes, you want to make sure your blood, your blood, your blood sugar is well controlled. If you have high blood pressure, you want to make sure your blood pressure is well controlled. If you have some sort of pain, mm -hmm. pain, uh, pain, the problem that you've been taking medication for, make sure you take your medication. If you can, if you are, if you want to lose some weight, do some walking, just kind of make sure that your body is in good shape. Those are things that you can do to help. Um, you know, it's not, you know, those really lead to you having a good outcome. So you can, you can get, you can get out of, you can, you can recover from the surgery faster. If you were in the hospital, you can get out of the hospital faster. If you were at a surgery center, you can go home earlier and your pain is, and you have better control of your pain. Speaking of things to do before surgery, we have a viewer, Christine's wondering, what about imaging? Does imaging make my surgery work better, for instance? Is it a critical factor in your decision making on whether a patient should have this surgery, a laminectomy, instrumentation? How do you decide? Uh, surgery is a very, um, I'm sorry, imaging is a very important uh, aspect. You know, so the way I look at it, so let's say Christine were to come and see me in a, in, a, in a clinic, what I would do is I would listen to her, talk to her, figure out what kind of problems she's having. I'll do an exam and see what kind of sort of deficit of this, any sort of problem that I pick up. And then now we will, she and I will sit together, we will, we will look at the images that she has. So based on all these three factors, you know, uh, it gives me an idea what, what kind of problems she's having. 
And then the image will really tell me, okay, she has this problem. This is what I'm seeing. And this is what would really work for her. So mm-hmm. in terms of like we talked about, in terms of laminectomy versus hemilaminotomy, you know, those were the thing the images will help because, you know, if I look at the image and then there's a chance that she may be unstable if I were to take out the spinous process in the whole lamina, I may discuss where about possibly doing small a small hemilaminotomy to see that if it would give her a good outcome. Versus trying to do a big, just a big laminectomy and leading that to be unstable, and then a year or two down the line saying that you know my, I'm, I'm in pain when I move, and then we have to go put screws in the back. Mm-hmm. Now, what about after surgery? What types of things should patients be doing? Sure. What, uh, for instance, after uh, neck surgery, uh, patients wondering what what she can do to make sure things get better and pain doesn't come back. For instance. Sure. So normally we say, you know, the first um, two weeks, you know, you take it easy. And if you have a neck surgery, we usually put you in a brace to help support your neck. Um, so the first two weeks, we say, you know, nothing, you know, take it easy. We'll see you back in clinic two weeks, make sure you're healing well. And then for the, for the remaining four weeks, so a total of six weeks, you keep the brace on. Uh, no excessive twists and no, over, no over activities. I want you to get up and move around, walking, but nothing too intense so that you can put a lot of a lot of stress on your neck the key thing is when you have surgery you want to make sure everything heals properly and if you do anything that's to kind of put stress on those that, that healing process you know you may be back you may not get the right sort of uh, uh response and you may need to have to come back to surgery so mm-hmm. that first six weeks is very important so you know we want you to we want you to be active and overly active that you will kind of damage your chance of healing yourself properly what what types of things are you worried about, Dr. Sarpong, for instance, after a surgery, a spine surgery, uh, uh, patients wondering, what do I need to be worried about? Like, when do I need to call you, Dr. Sarpong, sure, right sure. away? You know, a lot of people will have pain. So that's something that we always talk to people. We're trying to give you a good medication that you can help, that, that can help you. Things that you worry about post-surgery, you know, let's say you go, you leave the, leave the, you leave the, the surgery center you leave or you leave the hospital you, everything is going fine but when you get home you have increasing numbness increasing weakness problem using the problem going to the bathroom those are the things that we need to know about right away because that that tells me there's something bad going on that needs to be fixed right away mm-hmm. um you know sometimes pain can get worse and pain does get worse after surgery you know especially like in the, in the first uh 35 days because that's inflammation gets you know will kind of ramp up so Pain necessarily doesn't mean something bad is going on, but if the pain is just excessive and out of proportion what we did, you need to let us know so that we can worry about it. But what I worry about the most is if you have questions concerning about nerve uh, numbness, tingling, getting worse, uh, having weakness or having bowel bladder changes, changes. That means that there's an injury to either the nerve or there's a bleeding mm-hmm. that's causing compression of the nerves that needs to be taken care of right away. I see. A viewer is asking uh, about a family member who has a lack of essentially an L5-S1 disc, bone on bone, basically. And um, is there an age limit or is there a severity that would require you to choose a surgery in a location um, such as a surgery center or a hospital? Like, for instance, how do you decide, number one, is this person suitable for organ specialist surgery center uh, or is it better at a hospital? And also the second part of her question is, is there an age limit for surgery? That's a very interesting question. Is there an age limit for you, Dr. Sarpong? No, there shouldn't be any age limit for surgery, but things that we take into account when it comes to thinking about surgery and age is that, let's say, you know, does the patient have any, what we call comorbidity? So do they have any problem with um, poorly controlled diabetes? Do they have heart issues? Do they have problem with their lungs? So mm-hmm. do they have things that, if we do surgery, will make, we'll make them worse. So somebody has, mm-hmm. you know, really hard, bad heart disease and we put them on the table, they could die on the table. So that, that's not worth doing surgery with those people. So those people I will recommend, you know, doing the least invasive way, which is, you know, you know, interventional pain injections and, and that, that things. Um, however, sometimes, you know, age can also play a part in terms of what type of surgery we choose. So for example, let's go to the laminectomy, for example. So as we talked about, there's the idea of, you know, using this interspinous device. So let's say somebody has a compression and that, you know, we're doing a, doing a surgery like a laminectomy or do, that will cause problem for them. We may think about doing this in the spinous device, which is a very small incision. And you can just literally kind of go in and drop 
the device and expand the space and give and give that that spine more room. It helps, and sometimes people do well, and there's a, there's a low blood loss, and it's not a lung surgery, and patient and patient can do well, well well and go home the same day. So, it all depends in terms of one, you know, if they have any comorbidities that will kind of cause problems if, if they have a big surgery. Or two, if they uh, if the disease process is amenable to doing something very minimal versus doing something that's big, and and three, sometimes you um, you want to think about you know the best course of action. Would I want to do this for my own mom? Would I want to do this for my own grand uh, grandma? Mm-hmm. I want to do this for myself. And I usually try to have a very honest conversation with patients and give them and tell them like, no, look, if it were me, that's what I would do, but I'm not making that choice. So I, I you know I want you to talk to your family. Bring your whole family and let's talk about the risks and benefits and love to talk about what I'm worried about and we can decide if this is best for you. So those are the things that I kind of try to encourage. I'm trying to have a very honest conversation with family and also uh, honest conversation with patients so that they can decide what's best for them. Excellent. Even during this COVID pandemic, you it sounds like you prefer that interaction face-to-face, the examination um, and uh, I, I commend you, actually. Uh, uh, it's amazing that you are available to our patients in the community, and we thank you for that. Um, uh, I just wanted to reiterate uh, how many patients we've seen, Dr. Cho, Dr. O, Dr. Vu, um, Don Winder, Nash Keen, David Keen at the clinic. We've all seen patients who are so delighted that you're able to you know, sit down, have that frank, open conversation, examine them face-to-face, uh, because uh, one viewer is wondering, you know, there's a lot of these uh, uh, many, many other orthopedic spine surgeons and neurosurgeons who, whom they've met in the community or in other states that said there was no other treatments. How do you feel when a patient comes in and says, you know, I, I think there's still something on my MRI. What can you do because my leg still hurts or my arm still is weak? What, what would you do? You know, again, it all comes back to what we see, what we what I hear from sitting down and talking to them, what I what I pick up from my examination of them, and what kind of image what kind of what I see on the images. Those are the, sort of the key things that we that I use to decide if we can do something different. I never prescribe one I never say, you know, I never prescribe what somebody said, you know, there's nothing I can do. Doesn't mean that there's not, not something that we somebody else can't cannot can do. So what I would usually do is I would meet the patient, talk to them, kind of get a gauge of what kind of problems they have, and what I pick up on a physical exam and review the MRI with them and tell them what I see and what can can I be done. Mm-hmm. And um, if something cannot be done, I'll be honest and like, look, if I if I do this, it's not going to make you any better. So I'm, I don't think it's smart to do anything else. But if there's something that can be done, or if there's any sort of further images that we can do to help. I, I will recommend that, and we'll see where we, what that takes us. But um, you know, I, people have a different way of practice, and people have a different way of thinking about uh, disease problems. And everybody has their own uh, specialization skills, so that can also play a part in why people say we, I can't do anything else. Mm. And what about the role? Getting back to your last uh, segment of your presentation, the spinal cord stimulators. Do you? Uh, place those before or after surgery only is there is there a specific set criteria for you so for spinal cord stimulators let's say somebody comes to me and they don't have they don't have any they just have they don't have any path they don't have any image to find that may make me think that you know surgery will benefit them i think you can always play the spinal cord stimulator anytime you can do it before surgery or after surgery because the good thing about a spinal cord stimulator is like you can always take it out and it's a minimal uh, procedure to take it out. It's not something that you have to do with something big to take it out. And it's always really something that, you know, you can take it out. So if we do it first and the patient doesn't, doesn't do better and they want it out, we can take it out and look at other options for treatment. So I always mm. say spinal cord stimulator is uh, it's an avenue that we can always explore um, as compared to doing instrumentation or doing some sort of a big surgery, which you cannot, which we, which we cannot mm. only do. I see. Uh, we had a, question from a viewer about the laminectomy only is done before or after a, a spinal cord stimulator. It sounds like it depends on the situation. It depends on the situation. Um, you don't That's necessarily right. 
uh, feel one way or the other. You, you personally, Dr. Sarban, don't feel that a spinal cord stimulator should only be done after surgeries? Not, not, not necessarily. Mm, okay, I see. Very good. And um, one other question that I think a lot of viewers are wondering is, what brought you to the community and how, uh, how did you become interested in spine surgery? Uh, well, um, my family and I moved to this area because we love the area. We love the people. We love um, sort of the community. We love the environment. You know, Oregon is a great place to be outdoors. We have two dogs uh -huh. that we like to go outside with and walk with. So we are very excited to be in the area. And in terms of my interest in spine surgery, um, spine is something that we all we train as neurosurgeons from the day we started residency to the day we finish. So I've had a lot of interest in spine. I've done a lot of spine because of that intense training we have in it. And I think it's a very, um, cause you know, if you look at the majority of people with diseases, most people have uh, back problems and most people would need some sort of surgery in, in the future. So, mm -hmm. um, I think it's a need that we, we need in our community. And it's, uh, it's something that if you enjoy, you love doing it, I think so you help a lot of people out. So that's why I do the spine. That's why, you know, I, I'm really interested in, in, in helping the community and making sure everybody's happy when they leave, when they leave, uh, leave up uh, come and see us when they get, when they get treated by us so. well thank you dr sean pong and th thank you viewers for joining us and i hope you and your family stay very well um if you have any other questions viewers or wish to revisit this video go to paincareoregon.com www.paincareoregon.com and we uh, hope you all uh, have a lovely evening thank you Take thank care. you guys really appreciate it Thank you, Dr. Sarpong. Thank you.